Okay, continuing. So, I'll add a comment here to get started. In these credentials, I'm not just going to be communicating about the heart and the sun in the heart, though I will be. I'll also be communicating about other aspects of my own, you could say, mystical, yogic, spiritual experience that are very pertinent for a lot of people today, I, I know quite well, and that certainly were for me. And I'm going to be relating these to my experiences and realizations of the heart as we go. So continuing, this is uh, midsummer 1970. I knew I needed to look east for this huge need to satisfy this huge need for a transcendent realization of absolute oneness with God. At that point, I came upon a copy of a very well-read book at the time, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. I was staying at a friend's apartment for several days in Boulder, Colorado. With nothing else to do, I devoted three days to reading the book straight through. Yogananda's story was an eye-opening revelation for me, as it had been for so many of my hippie comrades. He'd been in the West for a few decades when he wrote it, and what he created was a clever communication indeed. Following yet another chapter of still more outrageous, mind-boggling miracles, heroic tales of great gurus and saints, and yogic interpretations of the works of such diverse individuals as Jesus and Luther Burbank, Yogananda would offer clear summaries of the latest scientific understanding of the subtler physical laws of nature. He spoke to my desire for miracles, and then he backed it up with rational logic and scientific endorsements from my Western mind. In this way, Yogananda opened me to the whole universe of spiritual phenomena, including the guru-disciple relationship and all the energetic, psychic, and subtle phenomena of yogic visions, ecstasies, and samadhis. He said that the summum bonum of yogic and mystical achievement, the ultimate yogic state, is nirvikalpa samadhi, the formless ecstasy of absolute union with the divine light and power in the thousand-petaled lotus chakra, the sahasrar, at the crown of the head. Now, nirvikalpa Nirvi is none, kalpa is form, so it's formless. And samadhi is a word that's typically translated as a trance state or a visionary condition, an ecstatic condition. Uh, its deeper meaning is the equalization of pressures, is one good way to put it. I finished reading the book around 9 o'clock one July evening. No one else was in the apartment. As I lay down on the couch to sleep, the question arose in my mind, I wonder whether yoga is going to be part of my path. And I should say here, I, I, was, I was electrified by this book. It was, it was so mind-boggling to me. I had no idea that such things were even possible, and they were intensely attractive to me, intensely so. So, I wonder whether yoga is going to be part of my path. It's just a question in my mind. Instantly, as if in response, I heard a high-pitched oscillating sound that appeared to be located behind and above my left ear as I lay with my head on the pillow. How odd. I knew without looking that there was no immediate physical cause of this, anom of this anomaly. I felt something else was going on. Yogananda had talked about meditating on currents of sound, so I decided to just relax and contemplate the sound itself. No sooner had I made this decision and given the sound full attention than an astonishing thing happened. Or I should say, I would have been astonished, except that it all transpired so quickly, I had no time for surprise. Immediately, upon my relaxing and listening, the sound moved swiftly to right outside my left ear. And I know, yes, you're seeing it as my left ear, okay. 
and then, then shot into it and right into the very center of my brain. When it reached the center of my head, it was as if, a, as if a rocket took off inside me. I instantly felt myself in an extremely small form on the top of what felt like a wave of energy hurtling at tremendous speed right, at, right straight out the top of my skull. First, there was a penetration of some barrier or membrane above me, and the, and the current burst me through into a visionary landscape. I saw dark green and purple mountains off in the distance and a deep blue sky that darkened progressively from the horizon to the zenith. Again, all this was instantaneous. I barely had time to register that perception when the next and momentous event occurred. There was what I can only describe as a peal of celestial trumpets and other horns. It was certainly the most glorious sound I had ever heard in my life. It only lasted for an instant, however, the celestial version of heraldic horns, and then the still rocketing current of energy blasted me through another membrane at the top of that world and into what I absolutely knew not. The only way I was aware that something had occurred and what its characteristics were was by inference at some later instant. What then occurred was that I suddenly came crashing back down out of an absolutely immense, infinite condition of freedom and utter joy and intensity that I could feel was at the sheer top of everything that exists. I was now flashing back down into my body, which I landed in, as it were, with a kind of shock or jolt. The supernal light of wherever I had been was still so strong that the insides of my entire body were illuminated in a radiant flash. Then I was back, myself again, lying on the couch, amazed. The first thought that occurred to me was, okay. I guess yoga is going to be part of my path. <laughs> I knew from my reading that I had spontaneously, by some mysterious grace, entered into that supreme liberated state that Yogananda called Nirvikalpa Samadhi. I spent the next nearly two years studying and practicing yoga, going to India, visiting gurus, meditating, I did everything I possibly could to learn how to duplicate that state and do what Yogananda said the great masters could do, enter it at will. So I'll stop the, the reading there. What else to tell you about this? There's a man I think I met in India, or pretty sure I met him in India, or maybe later at an important experience that I'll share that's much more about the heart, specifically. <clears throat> He's quite famous now. His name is Daniel Goldman. G-O-L-E-M-A-N, and he is the creator of the, the phrase and the, the whole perspective on human maturity and wisdom that uh, is called emotional intelligence. And Dan Goleman was, and I presume in many ways still is, uh, a devotee of the great Indian yogi saint named Neem Karoli Baba, who was called Maharaji, who, if you're a connoisseur of these things, uh, this is one of the first living Eastern masters who was brought to the attention of the West in a very powerful way, uh, not by Yogananda, who I was, whose book I was reading, 
but by uh, a man named Richard Alpert, who became known as Ram Das, who is still alive today. And uh, I won't go into all the story of how I met Ram Das and also uh, Daniel Goldman. The reason I'm bringing Goldman up is because in one of his early writings, I think it might have been called The Varieties of Meditative Experience, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I remember a specific phrase he used. He described how when one goes into such a state as I temporarily went into, it can create what he called cognitive shock. And it's safe to say that that's what happened for me. It blew my world to bits. Yeah, reading Yogananda's book definitely opened up my mind and my heart and my soul. It, it made me aware of all this part of human potential that nothing whatsoever had communicated to me in my uh, younger life, my time in my family, my schooling in a small southern town, and then going to actually a very uh, an esteemed preparatory school in Tennessee, from which I then was able to get a actually pretty fancy kind of what's called honorary scholarship, an honorary national scholarship to Harvard that was only given to about 50 guys in the whole class of 1,200 for leadership potential, blah, blah, blah. Linda likes me to share about these things. I always feel a little shy about it. <clears throat> my point being that nothing, not my countercultural explorations at Harvard, I knew that there was an East to turn to. And when I turned to it in Yoga, Yogananda's book, it opened me up in a big way. But none of that came close to the total derailing of my life and plans that happened through this temporary, I mean, there's no way to describe how long it might have lasted. I was still in bed. It was still the nighttime, so it couldn't have been too long. It may have been a millisecond, the whole thing. But it was utterly astounding and, and truly not only cognitively shocking, but psychophysically shocking to every fiber of my whole being, physical, emotional, mental, energetic, all my relationships, everything was blown to bits in that dissolution that also was an ultimate fulfillment. And something along those lines is what they call union with God in the more Western mystical traditions, Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And it was a formless quality of it. It wasn't a subtler, imaginal, heavenly, celestial version of a subject-object perception. There were, as you recall in what I was describing there, there were a few moments of such perceptions or instance seeing the landscape as I was hurtling up in this other world than any world that I knew of here. And then there, that being pressed up against the top of that dimension in this, you know, the heavenly version of da 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 <laughs> something like that. Here it comes, dude. <laughs> and then... So, utter pressurelessness. Not, not even having known how confined I felt until... And then spiraling back into the body and this flash of light and, oh, here I am. So, that was that. More to come.